Okay, for the audience. How many are there online? Okay. Mm. The current medical legal litigation comes if the patient's complication as a result stayed longer than the expected. Say you admit him for lap coli and end up with pancreatitis. One lakh or two lakh estimation becomes 20 lakhs. Then you will have a medical legal case. In my opinion, in the future, if the treatment is not as per the patient's expectation, if the patient is not satisfied with your treatment, that can also become a medical legal case because you are not treated according to his considerations as his expression, what he wants. So in other words, it is not just the best available evidence. It's not just your experience or expertise that you combine with the best available evidence. At the same time, you should talk to the patient and give them the available evidence, give them the local resources, explain what is possible in your hospital or in your city, and then let them make the choice. Only combination of all the three becomes evidence-based medicine. It's, it, it's a distillation of the available evidence with the available resources with to meet the best possible outcomes for that given patient. Any doubts? So if you look at each heading, best available evidence, for example, we have a patient in the ward about neuroendocrine tumor. If you want to look at um, best available way to treat a neuroendocrine tumor. You go to the resources and search neuroendocrine tumor plus lung. Or you have a patient who's a 39 year old female with a breast lump, which you have investigated with a core biopsy. And then you know it's a very palpable lymph node in the axilla, you have done a PET CT also. So it is confirmed infiltrating ductal carcinoma with a single node in the axilla. How do you, what is the best outcome for this given patient? So you go for CA breast locally advanced in a premenopausal woman to see whether neoadjuvant treatment followed by surgery, followed by adjuvant treatment is the best or because it's a single lymph node, you operate first and then go for adjuvant treatment. And then if you decide to operate, say 3.2 centimeter in a female with a large breast, whether you want to do breast conservation surgery or a mastectomy, all these questions you have to formulate in your mind. These questions will come into your mind having seen the patient, examined, investigated, proven a diagnosis, and then you ask these questions. Say we had medullary carcinoma thyroid on the other day. We had a mucosal of the appendix, mucosal plus appendix. Those keywords, how do you search the literature is a very crucial because literature, the search engine will give you the results what you are searching for. So if you don't know what to search for or how to fine tune your search, you will be lost in the vast amount of information that is available in the literature. So you, you must have a basic uh, good amount of knowledge, not the basic, for yourself before you can hit the internet asking for search engine to give you the answers. Like I said, if you look for medullary carcinoma thyroid plus management or treatment and then our neuroendocrine Mm. I think one of you should go and see. One of you, yeah, should go and see and come. Yeah, yeah, please. Mm. One of you just serve the coffee. I don't need it. Would talk about it. I'll call Once you decide what you want to search for, say, for example, our own patient, neuroendocrine tumor plus lung. Then where do you search and what do you search for? 
you want to search for randomized control trials or you want to search for meta analysis of those randomized control trials if there are no such randomized control trials then you will get the case studies or case series or not so robust randomized control trials having got the information from the net how do you read how do you interpret then how do you look at how it applies to your patient is also where do you search the internet obviously we all used to starting our search through the google in the beginning most of us search for the literature only in the google and the first or the second search publication that the google gives we click on that and take the lead from there but if you are uh, educated if you are aware of where to search exactly for a better information this is the cochrane library is the best and the next best is the pubmed so you should use the other all these are the other uh, sources where you can search for the uh, published literature available online so obviously we take the google search to search for pubmed or the cochrane because we would not have pinned these onto your desktop or if you are one of those practicing uh, evidence based medicine then you would have pinned this pubmed and cochrane into your desktop search task and then you click on it it will go there like we said for example is the neuroendocrine tumor plus the lung you put it and then it lasts whether uh, it will give you uh, say 1000 articles or 5000 articles then on the left or right hand corner it will have ran only randomized control trials or only case studies or systematic reviews or meta analysis you click on that it gets filtered into a little few articles and then you can download if you have the subscription and then you can read and then debate with it so it's important where you search for the literature this is the best available source of information for the medical literature next best is the pubmed yeah. cochrane was it ah. pubmed has pubmed and pubmed same so you want to download pubmed to give you the that size pubmed same the full article some of them have the paper but most of them are uh, the pubmed central what for the after 2 years some publishers keep it after 2 years it becomes open access some publishers after 5 years of publication it becomes open access because i am a member of indian association of cardiothoracic surgeons we have a subscription to elsevier publications we pay 5000 rupees per year all the journals that the elsevier publishes we have access to any article full text at any given time so each institute hopefully each institute should have a subscription to uh, there are only five publishers as of now in the world it's so monopolized elsevier and there are two three four publishers most of the journals that are published are published through them so if an institute is subscribed to one of those two publishers you will get most of the articles online having individual subscription to journals is one is costly one may not be practically possible it is best through the organization through the either like i said iscts organization or through the institute where you work if you are in a medical college i think most medical colleges have uh, enough uh, funds like in bmc alumni we have our own bmc digital library which uh, good subscriptions so th that's uh, that's where you need to search for the literature like i said once you know the topic like neuroendocrine tumor plus the lung then i look for only systematic review or meta analysis or randomized control trials i may get 5 or 10 journals and then you download and then read and see how many of them describe neuroendocrine tumors in a young 20 30 year old male how many of them describe tumors which are located in the right lung or the left lung which requests not just the bronchoplasty lung excision and how do you evaluate and how do you go about it and then if you combine that evidence with the our patient who is in the ward right now it's not like he is a walking around patient who comes with a neuroendocrine tumor he had a previous opposite lung surgery this is an interesting guy he had a left lung upper lobe hydatid cyst removed at his age of 9 years 
thoracoscopic removal. Post-operatively, he developed secondary infection, empyema, so they had to do thoracotomy decortication. So in this patient, tailoring to this given patient example is, he has mm -hmm. compromise in the left lung function. Left upper lobe is already, there is a little bronchiectasis and the in terms of volume and function, it is much smaller compared to the normal individual. So if I do, uh, my question in the preoperative that we discussed with, if we do a midland lower lobectomy, because the tumor is located at the midland lower lobe uh, bronch, secondary carina, and if we requires an intervention for the left upper lobe bronchiectasis, he will be in trouble. So what we did was, how did we tailor to this given patient? We did an on-table bronchoscopy to see whether we can save at least the middle lobe. Two segments, middle lobe, if you can save, makes a big difference for his future life. But on-table bronchoscopy showed the tumor infiltrating the middle lobe bronchus origin. So to get a tumor clearance, because he's a young patient, there was only way of getting middle and lower lobe, both of them out, at least one centimeter margin and then clearance. That's what we have done. So we know what the tumor problem is. We got, we know the literature and then we tailored to this given patient. We have also told this patient that his presentation of symptoms, hemoptysis, streaky hemoptysis, could be a symptom from the bronchiectasis in the upper lobe, may not be a symptom from the tumor in the right middle lobe, right lower lobe. So month down the line or one year down the line, if he comes back with a recurrent symptom, we know what is the most likely source. And that's again another reason why we did the bronchoscopy on table. If there is an active bleeding, that will also guide us. There was no active bleeding on table from the left upper lobe. So that is how I'm giving you an example of the patient who's in the ward so that you can understand it better, how we go about it. Little bit about Cochrane is established after the British epidemiologist. For the lack of better word, I have written it here, it produces. They don't produce because they don't sponsor any trials. They don't conduct any study by themselves. But they keep track of all the published literature in the, uh, with regard to the human disease and ailments and treatments not just the disease and treatment as well as the prevention and others. Anything related to human healthcare, they keep it in their database. It becomes easy for us, the clinicians, to search. One place where you want to search the best available literature is this database. So if you, we looked at how do you look for the best evidence. Individual experience, meaning treating clinicians, experience and expertise. Experience is the number of years. Say I'm in thoracic surgery for 20 years. In the thoracic surgery itself, if you go to a major center like Birmingham, there are uh, people, I'm a thoracic surgeon with interest only in lung cancer. There is another thoracic surgeon interest in only lung emphysema, lung volume reduction surgery. There's another surgeon with interest only in mesothelioma and chest wall tubers, reconstruction, etc. So, there could be a different expertise because of your interest, because the skills that you have developed specifically required in dealing with those problems. So if you don't have the skills, can you combine that with your colleagues in your hospital or in your city, collective or a teamwork, so that you get the best for the patient? Here, individual experience or expertise and availability of local resource is, say, for example, tomorrow, robotic lobectomy is the best for lung cancer. There's more and more evidence being uh, coming out and probably, you, I can say, partly the industry-driven. Say, tomorrow, there is a randomized control trial, thoracoscopy versus open versus robotic lung cancer, lobectomy and mediastinal lymphadenectomy. There is a clear evidence to say robotic lobectomy, mediastinal clearance as a lesser pain, quicker recovery, less immune response. So that's the best recommended for a given patient with lung cancer. So this literature comes from the Western patients where they see tumors of two centimeters or less, which we hardly see. Is robotic lobectomy available in our hospital? 
Does that mean I should not operate on the lung cancer? Does that mean the other forms of treatment are inferior? So all these questions will come into your mind. That's where you need to see available resource evidence with the, our own setup, with the, our own patients, with our own limitations. It's not your, just your experience and the skills. You also keep your limitations in mind, whether we can do a given job or not. Whether in a, there are many thoracic centers where there is no cardio surgery, bypass facilities are available. There are few thoracic surgery operations which you have to do with the cardiopulmonary bypass standby, say a large tracheoesophageal fistula in the mid thorax where you need to open the chest and you lose the ventilation. So that given patient may have to be put on veno venous ECMO, completely respiratory function is taken off, then you can do a good job. In that time, you need to be in a hospital which has the ECMO facility. Since we don't have the ECMO facility, Either I have to go and operate in a hospital like Narayana or Fortis where there is facility or if my colleagues are there, I have to send the patient there. I should not be fiddling around with those limitations. That's where your best evidence, your available resources versus limitations within the hospital where you are working. You have to keep all these things in mind and also to see how affordable the patient is. With best available robotic lobectomy, if it costs 25 lakhs, yeah, that patient may not be able to afford, even if we have the robot and even if I can do it. Thoracoscopic lobectomy can be done in 4 lakhs, then I have to do thoracoscopic lobectomy for it. Then is the next set of uh, patient's expectations or satisfaction. The, the outright Example of a patient limitation is the Jehovah Witness. What do you understand, uh, Praveen, when I say Jehovah Witness? Pawan, anyone? They won't accept blood transfusions against your... A subset of Christians who, who have certain um, um, faith or understanding of Christianity, they don't believe in resurrection of the Christ or they don't believe in accepting the blood and blood product. So if that such a patient comes, most routinely done operations, lap or lap appendix or lobectomy can be done. But if he or she requires a complex cardiac surgery, which requires the patient on cardiopulmonary bypass machine, there is no way you can do it without use of blood and blood products. Say you have a patient with a tumor in the carina, with the right main bronchus tumor infiltrating the carina. I need to do a major sleeve resection of the artery and the vein, then I have to be have the permission to use the blood and blood products in the event of a major uh, in a event of bleeding. If that limitation comes, you have to think twice whether to operate or to, although the best available evidence is the excision, patient is willing for surgery, but for blood transfusion, then I have to think twice whether to offer him surgery or to offer him an alternative treatment. We had a patient in the recently right lower lobe malignancy, non-small cell lung cancer, evaluated, biopsy proven non-small cell lung cancer. PET scan is done only N11 lymph node. So there are no N2 lymph nodes, though there are no distant metastasis. He has also undergone endobronchial ultrasound, EBUS and biopsy of the subcarinal, pretracheal, paratracheal lymph nodes. All of them are negative means an ideal candidate for a lobectomy based on the best available evidence how to treat a lung cancer patient as on today. I think one of two of you have seen this patient. But the patient himself is very scared of admission and operation. So almost the daughter and the son, they have come and visited us about four to five times over a month period. How do I convince? How do I convince? Each time we say, please bring the patient so that I can talk to him and explain what surgery means versus the alternate chemotherapy, radiotherapy, which is at least six to eight months of treatment with multiple blood tests, multiple admissions, even if it is one or two days. If you give them the full details of the potential complications of chemotherapy in terms of air loss, nausea, vomiting, if not any major complications, then he may reconsider himself for surgery, which is only three to four days in the hospital one time because pain management is far better. His apprehension may be because he has seen some of his relatives or friends suffering with pain following surgery. 
So only way is to give some time, do some counseling, give them the explanation and then wait for him or her to accept. And we are an Indian society with the mixed population of different religions. Each one of them will have their own uh, beliefs, especially our own patients saying, Rao Kaldal Beda, Yuvak Beda, Avak Beda, and all those things you have to keep in mind. I have left one blank slide to see if any contribution from you guys, any anything that you think of other than what I said about patients' limitations or expectations. Anything else that you think of? Because these, these limitations, you have to keep in mind. Okay? If there is... Huh? Financial. financial, of course, you have to keep in mind. Um, with regard to the financial limitation, I would say, if, if say, for example, uh, this patient's request lobectomy, lymphadenectomy, like I said, robotic lymphadenectomy, best available evidence says robotic surgery, but it costs about 12 to 15 lakhs, robotic staplers and etc., if we can't afford, then I can do a thoracoscopic lobectomy, lymphadenectomy, which costs about 4 lakhs because I have to use endostaplers to do the lobectomy. Even that, if they can't afford, then I can still do an open lobectomy where the cost can come down even further. Or if the patient can't afford that also, then you have to see where else it can be done within the limited resources. If he can spend only 40, 50,000 rupees, then I may have to send him to the Government hospital, TBD, uh, sanitarium, Rajiv Gandhi, chest disease hospital and talk to my friends there. Hey, look, this is a nice gentleman, operable, resectable, carcinoma lung, but he can't afford to be a patient in the private setup. Please do the needful. So you need to see how you can deliver the best available medicine for that given patient. If he can't afford a care in a private setting under my care, that becomes our responsibility. Or most hospitals have human resource department or social welfare department where they pick up these patients who cannot afford and get the funds from the corporate social responsibility, CSR funds from multiple companies. Each company has its own obligation to do contribute to certain amount for CSR, social responsibility. And, uh, and I, I, I shouldn't be saying this, but our hospital doesn't have that department. But I know most of uh, liver transplant surgeons and major resections are done with funds, crowdfunding or contribution from all these resources. So you need to find a way to fund that treatment if the patient himself cannot afford, but he needs it and if they request it. What is the need for uh, promoting evidence-based medicine? But it's a fact that a lot of our surgical practice, very few diseases have evidence-based medicine. In my own thoracic surgery, lung cancer has a best, one of the randomized controlled trials with regard to the lobectomy as a best form of treatment, which was published in 1990s. Then the Western lung cancer screening came into vogue and they started seeing tumors two centimeters or less. Then they started asking the question, why do a lobectomy for a small tumor with no lymph nodes? Then they did the trials on segmentectomy it is now well accepted. Any tumor less than two centimeters limited to that particular segment, like apicoposterior segment of the right upper lobe, you can do only segmentectomy and mediastinal lymphadenectomy. That also gives equally good results to that of lobectomy, which is all through the randomized control trials. Not just one randomized control trial, multiple trials in multiple countries giving you the same result. That gives you the assurance that this is the best way to go about it. But not many other conditions have the best available research, like mesothelioma. There is no way we can do a randomized control trial. Rather, they try to do a randomized control trial to do a neoadjuvant chemotherapy, radical fluoroneumonectomy, then adjuvant treatment, but the trial had to be discontinued because a lot of complications due to neoadjuvant treatment, post-adjuvant treatment, and then now the treatment for mesothelioma is limited to decortication and debridement, followed by adjuvant treatment, like that. There are many conditions in our own surgical fertility or medicine which we treat in the absence of best evidence. Whatever the available evidence, we use it. How do you generate or how do you promote best available evidence is access to this Cochrane database or PubMed or to the randomized control trials, available evidence like for PGs. You, you, you may not be able to subscribe it but if the institute has a subscription as a digital library, you get access there and sit and read and come back and you can discuss on par with the treatment.
treating clinician about available evidence and how do you go about it? How do you combine in a difficult, like we have a corrosive esophageal stricture the other day, medullary carcinoma, thyroid, which are not so common conditions. So that given clinician may not have all the information. Even if I sit and read about the available literature, I may overlook certain information I may not give importance to of that information in treating, but if you sit in the midst of MDT, where there is oncologist, radiologist, pathologist, nutritionist, or gastroenterologist, they will also give their input. They would have read and come. They may give importance of a certain point which I have ignored, relevant in treating this patient. And Dr. Lakshman and Ravi Shankar have done several workshops in several medical colleges promoting how to search literature about this evidence-based medicine, biostatistics, and et cetera. Also keep in mind, there is a more and more publications in the literature as on today than ever before. Because there is a push from the National Medical Commission or the Medical Council of India to get the promotion you have to publish. As a result, many medical college professors are publishing and it's open access publication is a menace. We, are, we were sitting in the editorial board meeting the other day Open access publications means you have submit an article and you give $3,000 or $5,000, your article more or less get published. Of course, there's a peer review process, but it is kind of ignored or neglected for the sake of revenues. So you are going to have uh, so-called uh, prospective studies, so-called randomized studies published in open access, available freely to you, but published because the authors have paid the money. Authors have paid the money to get this publication so that he gets the promotion and moves up in the ladder in an academic institution. So what available literature today, you have to take it with a pinch of salt before you take it at the full value or the face value. So what I mean to say learn is we, we are, uh, you are as a PG, you are learning something. Because the evidence keeps changing, you need to let go some of this information, some of this knowledge that you have learned. Typical example is if Dr. Lakshman and Dr. Munredi can remember in their training and everything, all the procedures were through laparotomy. Laparoscopy was not existing. They learned laparoscopy as, as and when the laparoscopy was introduced in the field because they all appreciated the usefulness and the benefits to the patient. Patients also started demanding. So they, they have to let go of the ego Humility to learn, unlearn the laparotomy, relearn. So you have to, what you have learned, you have to somewhere down the line, as and when there is a new evidence or a new way of doing or a new method of treatment, you have to let go and then relearn that new method and adapt yourself. You can't get stuck to the old methods or the only one way. My way is not the highway. You should be willing to let go and relearn. Some facts about EVM. You, you, so, so you are a very scientific student. You search for the literature. There is no good evidence to treat that given patient. Say pain abdomen with uh, low platelet count and uh, uh, say ejection fraction is 28% in a 40-year-old female patient. Then you are confused and you don't know how to go about it. There is no good evidence available in the literature. It doesn't mean the evidence-based medicine is a bullshit. It is about the best available evidence and then you combine it with the given patient, how you can solve the patient. And evidence based it's not just about numbers, statistics. It's not just beating around the bush. You must use the best available resource, interpret in a way that is applicable to your given patient and to, so that you get the best possible outcomes. The level of evidence um, is something that you guys need to know. This is Expert opinion are in my experience. It's not evidence-based medicine. It is eminence medicine that you can put it as level five in terms of level of evidence. Then you get case series or the case reports or a review or meta-analysis or a review of such case reports only. That becomes level four evidence. Then comes the case control studies, cohort studies, are a review of such studies comes into level three evidence. Perfect randomized control trial, double blind, 
multicentric is here. That is level 1B evidence. Meta-analysis or review or multiple such studies giving you the same result is level 1A evidence. Randomized control trials are non-randomized prospective trials. A randomized study where the numbers are not sufficient or the follow-up is insufficient or combination of such studies comes into level 2. If this again can be split into 2A, 2B, 3A, 3B, etc. But generally level 1, 2 is the best available. Level 1 is the best evidence if available that you should see how to incorporate that evidence into your clinical practice. This is how it is recommended. If there is level one recommend available evidence for a given patient, then you can put it as recommendation A. If it is level two, preferably, then it is recommendation is B. And then C and D and then go on depending on the level of evidence that is available. I'll stop here for one or two minutes for any comments or suggestions or from the Lakshman, Ravishankar, Niranjan or you guys. The best example for uh, very good. I believe that uh, you know this. Learn, learn, forget, relearn. Is the uh, this one enhanced recovery program? That was a, a set of uh, trials which were done of individual components of all the you know patient, the post of any of the you know, post of any care of the patient. All the uh, experience of the previous surgeons, they were all going by what I did for the last 50 years, what my teacher taught. There was no evidence base to suggest what they were doing was right. So individual components of question and uh, evidence was found and then the whole thing came. So this is the, uh, again, another thing is the, uh, if you looked at the operating system in the 80s and 90s, it was filled with people who are undergoing uh, you know, uh, DJ Vagot and Gastrogenosmy Vagotomy and their protocol Vagotomy or extra with the special you know, the, the Vagotomies, which now has become obsolete because good evidence came up in the 1988 89, which showed that the uh, uh, Helicobacter pylori is the reason for majority of acidity and treating the Helicobacter pylori now the two years, you know. Eradicated all surgical aspects. Again, joining the Edison syndrome, we would do total gastrectomy, stomach process, and yes, and by standard, we would operate and remove the stomach. So that has now become obsolete. So it is about you know, looking at the evidence and dealing with what, what's happening now, what is the newer things that are coming up. It doesn't mean that you should take everything that comes new as personal to and everything old is bad. How to exercise that is why this general clubs and things discussions will come into play. But you understand how to glean the evidence and how to you know whether and other thing is what evidence is there may not be applicable to our situation. So again, that is another thing you have to understand. What is applicable to Western population may not be applicable to you. So you have to understand these things. I just make a few comments until. Until this point, some of which you may cover later also, I'm not aware of it. When you're talking about search, what happens is when you put a search term in Google, for example, it will throw up literally thousands of papers. So you must learn how to narrow down the search. One of the strategies is to use what's called Boolean operators. So go and read up about it. I'll send you a link for our book on videos that describes how to narrow down the search. Uh, using what is called Boolean operators. So something where we close up thousands of you know, you know, articles can be got on 50 or 60. We, and you can see the, you know, the, the uh, abstract of those and then find out which is the one that fits the best. Okay, and Cochrane that you mentioned about is systematic. One the best. Why is it the best? They have laid down strict criteria about the selection of papers and the evaluation of those papers. So if you have to you know, look at the top range specifications, it is really mind boggling, but that is the best. So you can really depend on what top range is. Mentioned about BMC and access to key articles. Unfortunately, BMC is hooked to Rajiv Gandhi University. At the moment, RGHS has no heading. Mm. For the last eight, nine months, 
or maybe even a year, there is some politics there with surplus not, funds. Or funds. Yeah. They have not, they have not uh, subscribed to this consortium for DNA. So at the moment, DMC or Rajiv Gandhi University cannot give you any help. He made a very important point that evidence sometimes, evidence sometimes is industry women. There are I think you guys must get into it. I won't go into the details, but you must read up about how the industry is actually manipulating evidence. And so one must always be careful about it. <laughs> yeah, that's true. And the other thing is if you do and so that in surgery, Rashika mentioned it, you don't have RCTs and you know meta-analysis for many things that you do, which has two very important uh, follow-ups, important things for us. A, it is an opportunity for you to do those assets whenever, you know, if you're interested. Second, you must then fall back on what is called standard of care, which is generally a consensus statement. So you then have to fall back on guidelines and societies. Many of them will be level C or level D evidence, but that's all you have for the time being. So that term is called standard of care. And now all of you do it, but I'm rephrasing it. Point of care reference is very important. When you go and see something, you do not know what to do. So go and just say, we have nice phones with you. Just look here. You know, literally in two minutes, you will get some information. You cannot be the best. You cannot get particular prizes and all that. But it will give you a good uh, you know, exposure as to what you should be doing at that time. And that will make you confident in what you do. Finally, as Ravi Shankar mentioned and Rashad mentioned, critical appraisal of the paper is very important. You do not swallow everything that that uh, your journal tells you. So learn that skill and then you'll be a good Thank you. Um, my topic also says quality assurance. So I'll make a few comments on that quality assurance. The best way of quality assurance from an individual clinician, individual practitioner's point is if I practice evidence-based medicine or evidence-based surgery, that is assuring quality, not just to the patient, to myself. To the myself, because I want to go home and sleep well, because say five years, 10 years down the line, some complication has happened in some patient and some court case comes up. I can always go back and easily face that litigation, face the patients and family says, I have done whatever best available, evidence-based, tailored to you on that day. I have not faulted, I have not made any uh, negligence or I have not, there is no deficiency on my part. That's the best way to assure quality at an individual level. Like empathy, like we said, tailoring the available evidence to that given patient. The only way is you have to sit and talk to the patient and assure them or answer their queries and apprehensions and etc. When it comes to uh, quality assurance at the departmental level, please read this carefully. In the 21st century, if you don't know how to read a paper, how to interpret the numbers there, how what it means to you and your patient, you are as good as, as if a clerk or a naya, that it, it, you are not a clinician at all. That's a comment given in the BMJ. In the 21st century, if a clinician cannot read the uh, interpret is unprepared to deal with the clinical scenarios that in, in the day-to-day -day practice. So the only way that the quality assurance from the departmental level is involve yourself in the teaching so that teaching is the best form of learning. We sp I spend a lot of time in preparing to just to come and sit as a moderator me or Niranjan or Ravi Shankar or Lakshman, we would have read a lot more than the you who is preparing the PPT. And then whenever you are in a department, there are always certain standard of care or standard of practice or the protocols that need to be audited, that you need to follow so that you don't miss the points. And then once in a while, once in six months or once in a year is to look back and see whether you are following the protocols that you have established, which is a cycle of audit. And the other form of uh, promoting evidence is the journal club. This is where the comment line. If you, you need to know how to get the literature that you want, 
you need to know how to read it you need to know how to interpret critical appraisal of a paper that is very well done in our hospital through the journal club very well done through the clinico pathological or clinico radiological meetings very well done through the morbidity and mortality meetings this system which is in this hospital is absent in many teaching hospitals in medical colleges also only when you go out of this campus you will realize how valuable this information is and quality assurance at the institution level at the hospital level apart from the various uh, local licenses like the uh, uh, hospital license or uh, health fire department or esi license renewals etc the best way for a patient at the institute level is the national accreditation board of hospitals and healthcare it's a pan india organization there is a set of renewal processes that they have to hospital institute has to go through when i say nabh accredited hospital means there are certain set protocols and guidelines that they have to follow it is renewed every 5 years and also re looked at the numbers documentation every 3 years or 2 years so the institute is generally more geared up or probably i would say better aware of what they are doing than other hospital which is not nabh accredited at the international level is jci the american based joint commission international then at the national level i'm just mentioning these points i'm not going to go deep into it um, at the national level if you can remember the covid crisis and the way the indian government handled providing a free vaccine to all the citizens and how they kind of gave the guidelines of admission hospitalization although it was a crisis that we all know so all this quality control public support legislation for violence against the hospital staff ensuring the quality on the drugs and pharmaceutical ingredients like the indian government cracked down on the corona stents which were uh, going towards north in terms of cost all these are the various uh, points i just to make a mention i'm not going to go deep into all these quality assurance details i'll end my talk with any comments from you quality assurance itself is a topic for one or two hours of discussion and debate so i just mentioned a few salient points and uh, stopped it there thank you lovely overview i think akshita has been here on the having done to giving you a very clear idea of what evidence is certain needs what remains what i cannot do what ravi shankar and niranjan and akshita cannot do is to make you believe and practice ideas and this you have to come from within very important and i i end this by one statement you goal should not stop at passing your exam right it is important passing dnp or ms is very important i'm not taking anything away from it but your goal must be to stand in a forum of 100 international circles Talk with the confidence and the self-assurance that is expected of a good surgeon. Right? That comes only from the practice of evidence base, nothing else. You got to stand up there and say, "Look, I did this because this is what the current evidence says." That comes from a lot of hard work throughout life. You probably retired, but still I need perhaps as much as you guys, maybe even more. Maybe even more. So what is important is that learn, unlearn. The very lovely sentence is put there. Learn, unlearn, and relearn. That is a fact of life. Every five years, the body of knowledge changes, and you must keep abreast all through your life as well. Thank you. See the practical aspect of it is I get very disturbed when people come up and say, "You know, this patient who has had a thyroid pain or." Aspectally or whatever, you will say should we continue antibiotics? What antibiotics should I send them? You should even not ask such questions. We practice medicine the way it is supposed to. So you have to presume unless there is any reason for you to change the protocol, which you can discuss with us or whoever. There is no need to even ask such things. You you know you always don't give the antibiotic half an hour one hour before, 
and you know, get fed up of asking the same question. So this is important for you to understand what is evidence based surgery and follow it. You know, I, I, nobody will criticize you if you follow that right. So that is something you have to, you know, you have, it should become aware as such that you should become completely married with principles of evidence based surgery. Only then you can practice medicine correctly. I, I would rather put it this way. If you uh, imbibe the concept of evidence-based medicine and know how to evaluate a patient of thyroid swelling, multinodular goiter, how do you go about it? What is the evidence? Salt nodular goiter, how do you go? What is the evidence? Breast lump in a premenopausal, postmenopausal woman, how do you evaluate? How do you treat it? If you develop these concepts, commonly seen conditions, breast lump or thyroid or neck swelling or varicose veins or pain abdomen or lump, if you develop these concepts, passing degree comes as a byproduct of it. If you are aiming only to pass the exam, you are lost. You, you got lost the concept of evidence-based medicine. But if you imbibe this concept into your day-to-day uh, -day learning, passing the exam comes as a byproduct automatically. And also remember your textbooks will be like whatever the information provided will be probably used to be five or six See, two examples of what uh, Dr. Lakshman said. See, basically, there was a lot of debate about the, the Melendez mentioned about early match being used for IPOM repair. And now that argument is gone because we got a lot of evidence that we now provided to show that you know, any match is prone to developing complications like addition, crystal formation, and intercellular obstruction. So, mesh does not provide you the if you just do that, having a more expensive mesh is going to give you protection. That is not, not true. There is good evidence to submit that. So the, that argument has slowly gone away. And second was now, because that argument, they couldn't then, they started saying abdominal wall reconstruction and, uh, you know, things like that. And in the last day in the state conference, there was a debate about abdominal wall reconstruction with the standard what we were using, ICOM and ICOM plus. And you know, fortunately, I was able to provide such good evidence. The opponent who is an exceptionally gifted uh, uh, academician could not, you know, argue against what I have provided. So it means we should be able to get such good evidence that whoever is on the other side should accept what you are saying because they can't, you know, fault the level of evidence you are providing. So that is the most important thing. So you have to understand that. And okay. again, the, in the surgical society meeting we had um, six months ago, they were talking so much about robotic surgery and things. And I stood up and told them the current 2021 2020 21 uh, paper, paper that came out, which showed that laparoscopic stroke open operation for rectal cancer is better as of now or for oncologic purposes compared to robotic surgery. And that is a study done by robotic surgery. So they can't argue. So 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 one of the week who talks about a lot of these evidence things, he couldn't answer and he couldn't refute what I said. So that is what you should all practice. If if you are in an argument, don't argue for the sake of winning. Debate should be for the sake of what is correct, not for the sake of winning. If you are not winning, please accept. Have the humility to say, yeah, I'm I don't know. I will go home, read, learn. Humility to accept and learn is the best way to climb up in the ladder, grow in your career. Don't get stuck with the fixed idea. I will not accept the defeat. That's not correct way. Thank you. Nice. We will end it here. Yeah. There you go, Puja. Right time to end it all. <laughs> so you're stuck in casualty. So,